thank you. Thank you very much. It's an honor for me to be with you today. Let, let me share my screen. And um, what I will try to do today is to look at the challenges and, and try to, to take a positive view to, to those challenges, which I think is, is really important. Uh, so let me uh, start uh, with a video, which I think uh, is, is important uh, that we look at, uh, because we need to recall the importance of, of the right to food. So if you allow me, I will play a, a little video. Food means blessing. Food is life. And uh, in this way, the food is the first thing. So it's important to understand that we can achieve this uh, and we need to change substantially the way we are doing things to be able to achieve SDG2. Uh, but it's important to understand also that there is a right to food that we need to, to respect. So what is the situation today and why we need such a, a big uh, change in the way we operate in the agri-food system? Today, if we rank uh, the drivers of food insecurity, uh, the first one will be conflicts followed by slowdowns and downturns where COVID-19 has substantially operated and affected many countries, especially the most vulnerable, and of course, climate variability and extreme. And climate change affects in, in four dimensions. It affects in extreme temperatures. It affects in increasing rainfall or lack of rainfall. It affects in terms of variability because that makes more difficult for farmers to make decisions, but it will also affect in the way diseases uh, will evolve. That's something that we need to be very careful about. And all of those drivers, of course, affect the cost of affordability of healthy diets. The video stated that there was enough food. And yes, there is enough calories in the world to feed everybody, even to feed the 10 billion people that we're expecting to have. But the challenge is not just calories and the challenge is distribution of those calories, but it's also quality diets. And for that, still, we are not there. And there is still a gap in the nine food groups that we need to have available to satisfy the needs of the population and increasing population. Now, if we look at the numbers, uh, they are not good at all. Uh, as all of you know, uh, the number of chronic undernourishment is 828 million people. It increased 150 million people more in the last two years because of COVID-19. And we have 3.1 billion people that don't have access to healthy diets. We are not on track of achieving global nutrition targets, despite there has been some progress in child stunting and exclusive breastfeeding. And 2.3 billion people doesn't have adequate food in 2021. The food hunger map of, of FAO, which we relaunched this year, shows that this is affecting all Sub-Saharan Africa, especially Langlong countries, South Asia, but also is affecting Andean countries in South America and Central America, which was a surprise. And this was mostly because of the effects uh, of COVID-19. Now, in this environment, we come to exacerbate the situation with the war in Ukraine. And these are the three scenarios that FAO projected. And today, in the current situation, we are moving to the last one, the most severe one, which means 13.1 more million people will be in chronic uh, hunger or, or what we call chronic undernourishment. And the reason is because uh, Russian Federation and Ukraine represent 30% of the cereals exports in the world. And in the left-hand side, you see how many countries depended more than 30% uh, on imports from these two countries. And on the right hand side, another dimension is the fertilizer, which Russian Federation being the first exporter of nitrogen, the second of phosphorus and the third of potassium. All these challenges have exacerbated the situation even more. And that's why our food price index was historically high in March of this year. Although in the last six months there has been decline and I will elaborate on that. But when you have a situation like this, that is a situation where because of high concentration of exports of cereals, and of inputs, fertilizers, countries react and they react very quickly to this. And they normally don't react in the way that we they should react. 
And that's what happens in terms of trade. And what you see in this graph is how much the trade was restricted. So the vertical axis shows the number of calories being traded and the horizontal, the weeks. The blue line is for COVID-19, which there was a small spike at the beginning, but then immediately settled down. The yellow line is the food price crisis in 2008. And the red is what happened because of the war in Ukraine. As you can see, the level of export restrictions substantially increased up to 17% and for a longer duration than in the food price crisis in 2007 to 8 And latest in the last weeks, it had decreased, but now it's increasing again because of the restrictions being imposed on rice. If you want to look at the decomposition, you will see that most of the restrictions are on wheat. And the red part here shows rice starting to increase. And this is extremely dangerous because rice is a major staple for the world, for South Asia, but it's also the major imported commodity in Sub-Saharan Africa. So Sub-Saharan Africa is the major importer of rice in the world. So if something happens to rice, which had not happened up to now this year, rice was doing extremely well, uh, it could be extremely dangerous. And what happened in Pakistan with the flooding, which is the third exporter of, of India rice, show us the vulnerabilities that we have. And that's something that we need to carefully look and assess. Why? Because all this is reflected in prices. And prices, as you can see here in nominal and real terms, have been substantially increasing. They fall in the last six months, but in the last month, in the month of, of September, the fall was mostly because of oil seeds, but cereals start to increase again. And they increase because of two reasons, because of vulnerabilities of climate in some key exporting countries, and also because of the uncertainty on the renewal of the Black Sea Agreement. So we need to be monitoring this very closely. Now, the second dimension, which is affecting uh, countries, especially net food importing countries, is the strengthening of the dollar. As the dollar strengthens and the currency, local currencies devaluate, that means that the value and the cost of imports for import depending countries uh, will increase substantially. So there are two sources of increasing the food import bills. One is the higher prices, and the second one is the exchange rate devaluation. And as a result of that, the food import bill of the most vulnerable countries, as I see show in this graph, green is low income, red is lower middle income, uh, sorry, blue is lower middle income, and red is either countries, has increased substantially. For the most vulnerable 62 countries, the food import bill has increased $25 billion. And that's why it was so important for us, the food import financing facility that we were proposing and which finally the IMF decided to adopt and call it the food crisis window for food security, which is exactly the idea is to support countries in having access to food. Because this year, the major challenge is still food access to food for the most vulnerable countries. The more longer or medium, short, medium term effect is the fertilizers. And what we observe here is how urea, DAP and KCI had increased substantially in terms of prices. And this increase has been because of several reasons. One of those is because of export restrictions, which has increased, especially coming from the side of, of the Russian Federation, but also the side of, of China, which has increased export restrictions, which has exacerbated problem. The second major element is the increase in, in, in natural gas prices, which substantially increase until the month of September. And that make and accelerate the closure of nitrogen plants in Europe. And Europe was a net exporter of nitrogen. And therefore, the availability uh, of nitrogen and fertilizers in general has been reduced in the world. And as a result of that, prices increase. The major challenge we have right now, because natural gas has fallen substantially in the last three weeks, which is really good news. And we hope that this will allow some plants to reopen. But still, we have a problem of scarcity of potash. And what this ends happening is that we have an affordability problem for the farmers. So in the red line, uh, you will see uh, how affordability is reducing for farmers, which means that if they produce, they will be losing uh, because the prices of the commodities are increasing at a lower rate relative to the prices of inputs. You must understand that if fertilizer prices increase, that means also that seed prices increase because seeds needs fertilizers to grow. And therefore, all of the inputs, including transportation costs, has been increasing, and that has a significant effect on the affordability of farmers and that's something to look at. So what this brings us up, it brings us up to a system, an agri-food system, which is under risk and uncertainties. Risks is when you can 
predict the loss function. You can predict what will be the damage, therefore you can insurance. But uncertainty is something that you don't know the loss function and therefore you cannot predict and makes it a lot more difficult. So we need to change the way we think in agriculture because we cannot think of it of an environment where there is no risk and uncertainties. FAO has divided the risk in three blocks, the humanitarian risks, where we need to react immediately to supply the needed food, to avoid migration and to support refugees. And that is something that has to be an immediate response. And for that, we need to be prepared, but we also need to be prepared to help on humanitarian in also allowing them to grow food because that's a lot more cost effective than just cash transfers or food transfers. The second set of risks are related to the macro environment. And of course, energy and inputs relationship and biofuels is really important. We knew the relationship with biofuels, we didn't know new before the relationship with fertilizers. And that's important because that affects that any change in the energy mix will immediately have an effect over fertilizer prices and that will have an effect over food security. Debt, growth and exchange rate, especially debt and exchange rates are central. 62 countries are facing significant balance of payments problems. And these 62 countries are food importing countries, are countries that depend on the prices of import food and depend, of course, on the exchange rate levels. And therefore, it's really important uh, to be careful on them. And finally, nuclear contamination can destroy fields and operation in land for more than 10 years. So we also need to look carefully at that. And the third block of risk are related to food and agriculture. And here, of course, we have the inputs that we were discussing already, the trade that we already discussed, which is so important, and the logistics and infrastructure. COVID-19 showed to us how important logistics and infrastructure were. And that affects production and will, of course, have a correlate on prices, but also on diseases, which we need to monitor very closely. Now, all this is happening in a world where we have population growth and urbanization, climate change and water stress. And let me look at those three long-term drivers because they're extremely important. First, in terms of population growth, we know that the interaction between population growth and demographic changes impact food demand, trade and markets. And urbanization is associated with considerable changes in lifestyles and consumption patterns. Extreme population wrong will happen in Asia and Africa, and this will increase food demand. And we know that if we continue the current trend, Sub-Saharan Africa will surpass Asia in terms of the chronic and the nourished people. Climate change is a little bit more complicated. Changes in climate variability, seasonality, and extremes have impacted agriculture and food systems worldwide, including crop, livestock, fisheries, and aquaculture and forestry systems, resulting in acute food and water insecurity among millions of people with higher negative impacts in mid and low latitude regions than in high latitude regions. Climate hazards and their impacts range from the negative effects of ocean warming and ocean acidification on the productivity of shellfish, aquaculture, and fisheries to increasing extreme temperatures and precipitation events causing crop failure, heat, and cold stress livestock, as well as droughts and wildfires depleting forestry systems. In particular, the main climate biotic hazards affecting crop systems will include temperature crop cycle duration, precipitation, sea level rise, weather-related pests, and many other. So we need to look at all those atmosphere changes the weather-related pests and disease, and the droughts and wildfires. The most export locations and communities are located in Africa, Asia, Central and South America, and small islands and the Arctic. Also, we need to understand that climate change will endanger the production of major crops. And we have done some simulations based on the latest uh, IPC scenarios. And for example, for maize, the most important crop in terms of global production and food security, the global productivity will decline between plus five to minus six percent. For wheat, from five percent to nine percent. And for rice, from plus 23 percent to plus two percent. So we need to look at these challenges. We need to look at the locations where this is going to affect. Because the consequence of this is that this will have an, expect, an, an effect over trade. And regions projected to experience declines in agricultural production will need to increase imports. And countries where agriculture accounts for a large share of GDP and employment are particularly vulnerable, as you can see in this map. The red, the decline, means the decline, and the green means where it will have an increase in input. So we need to be very careful on how we assess the situation uh, and how we need to, to be careful that we are prepared for these type of situations. And finally, water stress. 
128 million hectares, 11% of rain-fed cropland, experience high to very high severe drought frequency. And 656 million hectares, 14% of pasture land, experience high to very high severe drought frequency. 171 million hectares, 62% of irrigated cropland, experience high to very high water stress. And this is affecting 3.2 billion people which live in agricultural areas with high to very high levels of water shortage, the scarcity, and out of which 1.2 billion, a sixth of the world population, live in agricultural areas with very high water constraints. Now, this brings up how important global value chains will still be there. And of course, we need to try to shorten value chains when we can do it, but global value chains will be central. And there has been an increase and an improvement on global value chains. And global value chains, when it cross three borders, any product of food that you buy in a supermarket, which is not a raw, raw food product, has a multiplicity of inputs from different countries. That's a reality, and that's a reality we need to understand. But also, we need to find ways in which we can increase production to diversify production in the world, and that we can shorten value chains when possible. But that doesn't mean that we need to restrict and go against the creation of global value chains. Regional trade integration will be central. But what we are observing is that trade intensity is higher within rather than across regions. And geographic proximity, similar preferences, and trade agreements help to shape regional trade clusters. But there is a distinct regionalization of trade in all regions with the exception of Africa. If you look at the colors, the Africa cluster changes across years substantially, which means that despite the, the agreement that they have on interregional free trade, they are still not there. And that's where we need to look at. But trade, of course, uh, has an effect over the three dimensions of sustainability. It has a dimension of economic sustainability because it can raise farmer incomes, but it also can have the negative effect of import competition, which can lead to income losses. On social sustainability, trade can lead to more diverse diets, but also agri-food trade may contribute to rising inequalities. And on environmental sustainability, it can help for adaptation and mitigation, but exports can incentivize environmental degradation. So we need to consider and look to all the trade-offs behind this so that we can optimize and minimize the trade-offs and choose the pathways that will allow us to achieve zero hunger, minimizing those trade-offs. So what we should do in this complex environment? First, in the short term, we need to provide humanitarian assistance to the most vulnerable right now because of the food access problem. We need to target social protection programs. We need to identify the new hotspots of food insecurity and we need to support the agri-food chains of those most vulnerable. We also need to support for food access, balance of payment problems. And for that, the food import financing facility can play a crucial role, and we are very happy the adoption of it by the IMF. But we also need to achieve efficiency gains right now, because we need to accelerate in avoiding the closures of trade. We need to increase information transparency through the agricultural market information system, and we need uh, they, to use fertilizers more efficiently. And for that, we are pursuing soil nutrition maps that will help to have the proper blending. But we also need to reduce food loss and waste. And that's something that we can done very quickly, especially waste in the short term and in the medium term. It's impossible that today with the numbers we have, we have 14% of food losses and 17% of waste in the world. That needs to change. And for that, we also need to learn how to better target interventions. But what to do in the medium and long term? In terms of trade actions, I think we need to reorient policies through targeting resilience and sustainability. And this requires phasing out price interventions and trade distorting producer support, targeting income support from <coughs> households that are most in need, and repurposing public expenditures. So the, this year, we have done in the SOFIA a special area uh, section where we look at repurposing of subsidies because we have almost 630 billion per year given to countries between 2013 and 2018, but per year. And most of these, as you can see, are fiscal subsidies to producers, which could be very distortive and agricultural producer support. So there is an important need to change that. And we presented some scenarios, what will be the impact of those. The first scenario was fiscal subsidies to consumers. The second was fiscal subsidies to producers. And the third one was on price incentives. And in the arrows here, you will see the orange indicates trade-offs and negative outcomes. The green indicates positive outcomes. And the larger the arrow, the bigger the outcome. As you can see, in all these different scenarios, we could have benefits. But we need to look case by case, country by country, to be able to resolve these problems. 
We also need to reduce disruptions through more transparency, as I mentioned before, and to avoid export restrictions. This is not the time to do that, and we need to strengthen the WTO. And finally, we need to unlock the potential of trade through trade facilities. <coughs> now, and to finalize, the agri-food system that we have and the transformation that we need is a world with risk and uncertainties, and there is no one solution to all the problems. So we are pushing the concept through our new strategic framework of better production, better nutrition, better environment, better life, of a package of portfolios of interventions that has to be part of these transformation pathways that we are following up with the hub as a result of the food system side. Those transformation pathways should look at humanitarian development, peace nexus, to scale up climate resilience, to strengthen economic resilience, to lower the cost of nutritious food along the supply chains, and to address poverty and inequality and also to shift to sustainable consumption patterns. But this can only be done if we understand clearly that we have a system, and these systems brings together the environment, the health, the social side, and other actors and other systems. And also we need to understand that we need to accelerate on science and innovation, on data, because data will be central for the actions that we do, and to understand the trade-offs of what we do, and governance and institutions. That portfolio package is what will help together with the financing levers to be able to do the transformation uh, that we need today and to hope at least we move in the correct track towards achieving SDG2. Thank you very much and apologies if I went on. Thank you. <laughs> no problem at all. Thank you so much, uh, Maximo, for really reminding us of the intersecting nature of some of the, the crises that we face and also uh, how some of our responses to those crises uh, in the form of, for instance, uh, export restrictions can, can further undermine uh, and affect global food insecurity. Um, was also very interested to hear your reflections on how global trade and value chains can be both a risk multiplier, if you like, in, in, in shifting risk between different countries, but also how trade can be a factor in reducing the risk and improving people's food security. Uh, I'm gonna just ask one very quick question, if I may, which is uh, just to pick up on your comments at the end uh, and on one of your slides, you noticed you noted the importance of cooperation uh, and uh, which will of course be critical for these transformation pathways to a more sustainable and resilient uh, agri-food system. Could you just uh, reflect maybe for 30 seconds on sort of the, the role that multi-sector collaboration has to play uh, in achieving a, a global food security uh, or the kind of results that it generates? No, for sure. And that's uh, extremely important because it's not easy. And most of our economies are aligned in silos, essentially. You have a Minister of Agriculture, you have a Minister of Environment, a Minister of Finance. And what we know now, and a Minister of Health, what we know now is that all the sectors interact with each other. So we need to find an institutional solution to that. There was an effort that was done uh, during the the one uh, during the SAN initiative, where they tried to do this institutionality, but the problem they had is that although they were able to develop certain institutionality, the money flow was not there. So I think we need to, to think differently and to work with governments to move towards a system approach. And that will take some time. So what we are trying to develop now, working with the IFIs, is how we can provide the incentives from the financing side so that we can facilitate that process uh, until the governments can develop this institutional change. But mm -hmm. clearly, if we don't accelerate the interlinkages, uh, we won't be able to, to resolve the problems and we won't be able to understand the trade-offs uh, behind the decisions that we make. Fantastic, thank you, Maximo. And there's just one question from the audience I'd like to put to you, if I may, before we move on, um, which is a question from uh, Bruna, hope I'm pronouncing that right. How do you differentiate the investments in large-scale production versus small-scale production uh, on, on these sort of predictions and, and suggestions? No, I, I think they complement e each other. We, yeah. we must understand. So, for example, let me take right now the problem of fertilizers. For sure, we need to assure that the global production is there because that's what will assure that you have food security next season. Of course, there will be smallholders and countries that use very little fertilizer today that any change in their access will have a significant impact. But yeah. we need to look at them at the same time. 
But if we don't look at the big producers together with the small ones, we won't be able to accomplish. So again, it's a way of doing a transformation with inclusion. So yeah. we need to complement both. We cannot move into the extremes. That would be the biggest mistake. Fantastic. Thank you so much.